Hi, my name is Robin, and welcome to Conversations About a Brighter Way. And I'm Adam Grant, the Executive Director of A Brighter Way. And we will be your hosts for this season, which is entitled Welcome Home. We'll be talking with people about their experiences re-entering society post-incarceration. What does that feel like? Honestly, that first four days, it was uh, it was almost as bad as being in a prison. What challenges did they face upon release? I did 30 interviews, and every one of them offered me a job. And every one of them rescinded it once they ran it up the flagpole, despite the fact that I had been honest and forthright. And what resources they found to help them navigate their path towards a brighter way? Family and friends. Those were the most valuable resources, knowing that, like he said, I'm not doing this alone. Speaking about a brighter way, Adam. I know every time that I tell this story, it's a little bit different, but I think that's kind of, you know, the whole point about what we do is, is we don't have a cookie cutter approach. We don't have these really smooth and and, and slick talking points. When you're talking about reentry through relationship, sometimes it gets messy. And that's what we do is reentry through relationship. It's the relationship whether we have with other organizations in the community. It's the individual relationships we have with people who aren't even necessarily involved in the mentoring program anymore. There's always an element of, you know, people sharing their experiences and trying to help one another. So you're just helping people to navigate through difficult sets of circumstances. So a brighter way is exactly that. And I think it's aptly named because it plays into my corny self so that every time I end an email or something like that, it's really easy to talk about how a brighter way is a collective approach to things and everybody lends their light to it to make a brighter way. That's what we do. Reentry through relationship, whatever it takes, we'll figure it out together and side by side. And I just heard something recently that someone needed help, but they didn't know how to ask for it. And so if you call a brighter way or email and just say, I need help, we will help you. We'll figure something out. Even if you're not in the region, we, we, we service Washtenaw County, but we don't like to leave anybody in the lurch. So we know people in different areas and we can at least point you in the right direction. Sometimes we would like to do more, but we're a small agency and we're focused. We're trying to do the best job we possibly can in Washtenaw County. And if we do this right, other people will replicate it. And then you'll have, you know, agencies that are doing this kind of work elsewhere. So let's get on to our episode. And this week, we will be speaking to LaWanda about their experience. I want to thank you for sharing your story with me. And Adam, thank you. You're more than welcome. May I have your name again? How long you were incarcerated and how long have you been out? Well, my name is LaWanda Hollister, and I was incarcerated for 34 years, and I have been home for two years. And how has that been? One word. There is no one word. It's been trying, if I had to use one word, trying. So walk me through getting out. What was that like for you? I want to know about your entire day. What time did you get up? Who picked you up? What did you see? Because I had been incarcerated for so long, I had no family or friends or anyone that would take me in. So a friend of a friend offered me a place to stay in Detroit, Michigan. And I didn't have a ride. So my agent approved for my friend Erica, who had also been incarcerated, but had been off of paper for five years. So she was released seven years ago. She did two years of paper and had been off for five years. So she approved for her to come and pick me up. And they told me to call her, the agent, as soon as I got in the parking lot. I did that. And she said she was giving me one hour to get from the prison to my friend of a friend's home where I was to be staying. So I was like, okay. She said, don't make any stops, not to eat, not to get clothes or anything. Go directly to your destination. So I said, okay. And we did that. And when we got there, 
As soon as I got there, introduced myself to a lady I'd never met, I called the agent. And I was, I think, like eight minutes late. It was, wasn't was more than a couple minutes. And she just totally went off on me. She was like, you know I can violate you. I'll send you back. I'm not going to tolerate this. And I'm like, well, what did I do? And she said, I told you to call me in one hour. You told me to call you when I reached my destination. And we didn't make any stops. We didn't do anything. And we got there. And so she was like, I don't know if she caught herself putting the fear of God in me or whatever it was. But at that moment, I knew that she was not going to be for me and of any assistance in anything that I needed. So so how old were you when you were in prison? I went in when I was 17, 1986, and I came out 51. And so I knew that there would be some challenges. I, I was told when I first went to prison, and I considered this a blessing by a therapist. When I first went in, she said that I can't call the name of it, but you basically get stuck at whatever age in whatever moment that you are cut off from society, whether it be in prison or in any, mental, any, any institution, you're cut off at that age. So. She said I would, of course, continue to age, but I would be mentally stuck at 17. And I was like, I'm not going to let that happen. So I did all that I thought I could do to keep up with the times, which is not much because that didn't work. (laughs) But I, you know paid extra attention and looked at things in a different way. When the officers came in, you know, with hairstyles or whatever, what, so that kind of kept me, if they combed their hair, but if uh, that kind of kept me like connected to some of the styles and paid attention to the commercials and things like that to, I just, like one one commercial that I was like extremely excited about was those Doritos in the little triangle. I was like, can't wait to get that. So, I, you know, I paid attention to television shows and everything to try to keep me informed about what was happening in society. Which says something about your mindset, because you know a lot of people shut it out. They don't want to live in two worlds at one time, so yes. they don't. So they act like the world on the other side Does doesn't exist. exist, and so they don't know certain things. And this is one of the things that we found at a brighter way. A lot of times is when people will come home that are juvenile lifers and mm-hmm. things like that who didn't think that they were going to get out, and everything changed at the last minute. They were ill prepared because they didn't do what Lawanda was doing, which was paying attention. Mm -hmm. And the reason why a lot of times people don't do that is because it's difficult. It's difficult enough to survive and to try to live in prison. Mm -hmm. But when you're straddling that fence and trying to live outside and stay attached to that, too, it becomes it becomes extremely difficult. Yes. Those very words that you just said were told to me in my very first few weeks. And it really didn't make sense until I got further into my incarceration. But they told me, you cannot live in both worlds. You can't survive in here and be all right and try to live out there. And I'm like, well, I want to live out there of course, but you can't do that incarcerated, which only means that I can't worry about the things that are going on out there. Like I had a son or have a son 
at the time he was a year old. And I can't try to raise and discipline and get mad at my parents because they're raising him, but they're not doing what I want them to do. So that's living out there. You, you, you're not running that out there. You're not there. You cannot do that and survive in here at the same time. And it is absolutely true. You do the best that you can, you know, and so I started making suggestions like with my son or whatever about, you know, things that can be done, but I'm not raising him. You know, y'all are there with him every day, all day. So you can't worry about your relationships and uh, your houses and property. You can't do all that and survive inside or you're going to be nuts. So that was what I call myself doing when the therapist told me that is I'm like, I'm going to stay on top of everything. But it, like I said, it didn't work out like that. Because when I got home, even though I knew what a cellular phone was, I had no idea how it worked. I still, you know, have a lot of complications with it. And you ain't got no problem taking pictures. <laughs> yeah, I, know I like that. to. And I'm getting. I think I'm getting better. Because one thing is like, I guess that would be the living on the outside. You always hear the news say. Oh, scammers, and they stole these people's identity. They took all these people's money, and they did this, and oh, how bad the cell phones is, and et cetera, so on and so forth. And then on this hand, technology is moving forward. So I'm in the middle of that fear that someone's going to steal, even though they don't want my identity, but they're going to sabotage in some type of way my life with this cellular phone. So I'm getting better because a lot of people have been on me about it. But I didn't do texting. I dare not open an email. And just those things. And I had to get comfortable with that. And, you know, and learn how and what. I'm, of course, not really great with it or even really good with it. The issues I have, I don't want to open myself up for that scam. I don't want to lose anything that I needed and not be able to retrieve it back. And it's just I had a lot of issues with the phone. One of the first ones was back to my agent. So I met her that, or talked to her that first day I was home. And then the next time I was supposed to meet her, I think she had me on like a two-week schedule. So I had to meet her two weeks from the first time I met her. She told me to Zoom her. I asked the questions that I thought I was supposed to be asking. So I'm like, okay, what is Zoom? So she says, it's an app on your phone. Okay. So I'm like, okay, I I don't even know what an app is, but okay. She says it's on the phone. I'll find it. So I looked through my phone, didn't find it. So I rushed out to the Did you have an Obama phone? No, I did not have an Obama phone. I had an Obama phone. I it, Obama phone, I think, I think is a phone that they give you with so many minutes on it and it's free to a certain group of people or whatever. It has so many minutes on it and then and it's done. Then it's done. And, and they're and they're free. And a lot of people when they come home get them and they're like refurbished and they're don't do what they're supposed to do. So you already don't know what you're doing. And yeah. then you're everybody's telling yeah. you how to operate your phone. And yeah. it ain't doing what it's supposed to do. It has like eight 
gigabytes of memory. So you put an app on there and it starts acting stupid because it doesn't know how to, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I have, tell them, um, tell them when you got, when you got out so that they know context of this. Uh, I got out in 20, May of 2020. Two months after the world shut yes, down from COVID absolutely. when everybody was on Zoom. Yeah. What, what do you mean you don't yeah, know what it is? I don't is? know what that is. So I looked on the app on my phone for this app. For Zoom. Yeah, for Zoom. I'm looking for everything Zoom, everything Zoom. So I ran out to the store, to the phone store. And I, matter of fact, I had someone take me and they never questioned, you know, why are you, you need to go to the phone store or anything. So I went to the phone store and I went in there. I'm like, I need a telephone that has the Zoom on it. And so they're like, okay. And so they sold me a whole brand new phone for $120. And then when I get back to where I was at, they're like, Zoom is an app. You could have just downloaded it. Well, y'all didn't tell me that $120 ago. So now I have another phone and it was an Android. And I, I started working with it and using it and getting better. So when I moved to Ypsilanti and I immediately became a part of A Brighter Way and A Brighter Way got me the Apple against everything. Totally I new. was like, I was like, I don't want no Apple phone. And I, I'm with I, you. I still yeah, don't want an Apple yeah, phone. I was like, I don't want the Apple. I'm going to just stick with this yeah. thing I got. I've just learned how to use it. I do not want that Apple. And they were like, oh, you need this Apple is, you know, so much better and all this. And so they convinced me to take the Apple. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to take the Apple. You know, it's a brighter way. And, you know, I'm going to take the Apple. The very first day I had the Apple, I couldn't even open it up. And it was like, I'm going to break this. I'm going to tear this up. And I'm just not, I had a whole meltdown, was crying because I couldn't open it in order to make a phone call. What kind of phone can I not make a phone call on? So I just had, and then the next day I couldn't wait for the next day to get there. And so I could be run over to a brighter way like, hey, look, I can't even use this as a telephone. And so they had to show me, you got to put in your little pass code. And now they got the face ID recognition and you put your finger on it and everything. So, you know, I'm here for those moments to be able to move forward. But initially I was like, I guess I won't be calling nobody. I don't want to <laughs> Apple bash. Actually, that's true. I, I Not true. I will Apple bash, but that's not what I'm here for. Um <laughs> My first experience, too, was at a brighter way when I got the job and I'd already okay. been home for two years and I couldn't get the thing to do what I wanted <laughs> it to do. Like, what? It, it, it was it was like speaking another language. And it was like I'd, I'd learned to speak Android to some degree. I still fumble. But yes. uh, so one of the first things that I did as executive director of a brighter way was as I passed the iPhone on to Jeannie, our deputy director, and I went and got an Android. Yeah, because it it was, you know, it was now I love the Apple phone and all the little gadgets and stuff that come with it. And I just don't know how I deal without the Apple. But initially it was a lot for me. Mm -hmm. And so that is how it is basically with every single thing, you know, is if you do not have someone there that will be able to guide you because no one wants to be told I'm 51. I don't want to be treated like a child. I don't want to be treated like I'm ignorant or anything like that. I still need help and guidance. If you can give that, then why not? You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, so which is what which is what we try to do because we're not trying, you know, if, if you've never been through this, people can't understand what you're talking about. They I mean, cannot. because they all have their own um lack of understanding. They all have their own technological mm -hmm. challenges. But they can understand starting over. And I, 
being clueless of how to even start over. I think people can do that to a certain degree. They can understand that they you can understand what it's like to truly do that and not to start over. She was 17. Yeah, I to went start from my parents at 51 to the penitentiary to back out here on my own. So I've never started. I've never done any of this stuff. Filling out a rental application. Of course, for anyone that's been here, like a normal 17-year, 18, you know, someone getting their first apartment, they have information to put on there. Not only have I never done this, but I don't have any information to put on there. My very first application that I filled out had nothing, and it was like six pages long, and it had nothing on it but my name. The man looked at it and was like, oh, no, but he still took my $75 application fee, you know, and so I... And that's real. Yeah, and 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 that's how it is. We're going around paying all these application fees, trying to get someone somewhere no one wants to house us, which I think is one of the most important things when you're a returning citizen is to have a safe place to be able to live. Yeah, you can't. I mean, what else are you going to do if you don't have that? You're not going to be able to go to school. You're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to receive mail. If you can't receive mail, you can't get certain levels of ID because you have it. So when she says that all it had on it was her name, think about that for a minute. She didn't have a credit score. She didn't have a former address. She didn't have a former employer. She didn't have any of those things. And the system doesn't teach you how to address those things. They, they Even on a job application, the way that they kind of explain it is ridiculous. You know, they say they, they they tell you to write an application and then how to explain your lack of work history. When you've been through it, you understand you don't do that. Did you not work while you were in prison? Every day. Every. The state made sure I had a detail. So what are they talking about? Lack of work history. You just have to do like the whole rest of the world and you learn euphemistic language on how to frame that in a good way. Because everybody else who's, you know, a garbage man, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with a garbage man, but don't nobody write that on their resume. They mm-hmm. write that I am a, a trash uh, removal engineer. Or and something then, like that. And then the, the issue with that, the issue with that is technically, by law, in the state of Michigan, I am considered a chef. I did all the testing, took all the state, and passed with very high numbers. And so I put on my resume, hey, I'm a chef. So they hire me. They're expecting me to do some chef stuff. I can't even use a knife. I don't I have no knife skills because we weren't allowed knives in there. Scissors or something. You know, the people a lot of people use their identification card to cut with, but I didn't do that cuz you know, I'm I'm sadity. I was going to say bougie, but <laughs> yeah, I'm bougie. <laughs> but so I, you know, would get a hold to an extra pair of scissors and then those would be my cooking scissors. So I use scissors. But to put that on there, so there's a restaurant here in Ypsilanti called Eat. They hired me. And when I got there, they're expecting me to, you know, like all my friends or whatever, they put themselves on the line for me to get this job and, you know, talk to the people and the people hired me. I get there and like I'm supposed to be cutting vegetables and doing all this kind of stuff. And they're like, what were you? What are you doing? I'm like shopping. <laughs> <laughs> They like, hey, y'all, hold on. Y- y- y'all just couldn't see that motion. It no, was pretty vicious. Motion. Yeah, I'm like, like supposed to be doing <laughs> celery, and and this is a not a fine dining, but it is a higher, you know, standard they making. Yeah, and so they like, you are chopping up all our stuff. What in the world is this? So I just it told them, look, I have no knife skills. And so luckily, you know, they brought somebody over to show me basic basics. 
so that I wouldn't be keep on messing up their vegetables. So I learned how <laughs> to cut the vegetables that I needed, but that was it. And that was all. And no other jobs are going to do that. If you're putting down, what did you call it with the flowery language? The euphemistic yeah, language. The euphemistic language. Yes. No I'm one's a little gonna, bougie yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one's going to do that. You you understand what I'm saying? Because they're expecting for you to do what it is you said on your resume you are capable of doing. And that's the same with where I work at. Avalon. Avalon. I'm so sorry, Avalon. <laughs> She's I tired. love She's you. She's had a long yes, day today. Yes, I am very tired. So Avalon and being a returning citizen is not wrote on my face or anything like that. You really don't. You want to fit in mm -hmm. and you want to go forward. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to tell people what it is you don't know. I've been at Avalon for a few months now since like March, and I've been going forward and doing everything that my immediate supervisor has had me to do, and they've been understanding and so on and so forth. So you have to do your time sheet. That's how you get paid. So my immediate supervisor had been helping me with the time sheet, my time sheet. Long story short, she went off, got married, and wasn't there. And so I wasn't able to do my timesheet by myself, so I didn't get any pay. So now Avalon is like, why didn't you do your timesheet? And I'm like, I don't know how. And they're like, why didn't you tell someone? And I'm like, who do I want to tell? Hey, I don't know how to do this. And my supervisor has been helping me with this. So what they did was they sent me to a tech specialist so that I could learn how to do these type of things because they don't want to be me to be working and then they're not paying me. So on one hand, you have to speak up and tell the truth. And not be you use euphemisms or whatever. I think you can, I, can do, I think you can do both, but 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 I, but, but I but I agree. So shout out, shout out to Bree. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, because because I think one of the things that she's talking about too is is you're talking about 34 years of incarceration. Yes. 34 years of incarceration tells you. To figure stuff out on your own. You, you, you don't ask people. Sometimes you have conversations with other people who are incarcerated with you and you and you chop things up in that way. But you don't ask staff if you don't have to. And, and usually if you do, you get spoken down to like either you should know or, or, or when you when you ride into a facility. Now, it's not the same thing in a women's facility because you were at two facilities in your mm -hmm. entire incarceration. Right. Because that's yes. all they had. And mm -hmm. they only have one now. But I went to 16 different facilities on 19 ride outs. You don't ask anybody where the chow hall is. You wait for them to call chow and you follow the line. Mm -hmm. You do things like that. And to give you a perfect example of how that works. I got a job as a, a programs clerk, and I'd never touched a computer. When the last time I touched a computer, it was a Commodore sixty four. Yeah, don't look How at me like you? that. We're not going to talk <laughs> about that. I think I just dated myself when I said that. And I'll tell you this: I was not extremely young when I did that. But I got a hold of. I, I got into this job, and they had a standalone computer at my job that was like a Windows ninety nine or something like this. And this was two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen, and. I clicked on that because I've watched stuff on TV and I paid attention to. I know what a mouse does, mm -hmm. and, but I don't know how to operate the damn thing. That's obvious because I clicked on it and I didn't know you had to double click to get it. So it clicked it and it shadowed. And I sat there and I looked at it and I'm like, man, this thing is slow. <laughs> uh, you know, five minutes later, I clicked it again. And I got another guy there, and like you said, I wouldn't ask. And he saw the 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 befuddled look on my face, and he said, what's going on? I was like, I think this thing's broken. It won't open up. I clicked on it, and he double-clicked it. And I was like, what was that? Because I heard it click twice. 
But that w- you get programmed not to ask. I, I broke a, four bones in my wrist. And I found out recently that, that that happened years ago. And I didn't go to health care because, of, one, I just thought I sprained it. Two, they're not going to help you anyway. And they're they going to charge you. They're going to charge you three days pay. Yeah. And I made good penitentiary yeah. money. I was penitentiary rich. And it still <laughs> costs three days pay. Yeah. So I let the four bones that are broken in my wrist go. And literally one of the bones in my arm grew longer to take up that space. And now my arm's jacked up. Mm-hmm. But that's the kind of thing that we're talking about that people. They just don't understand that that's how it is. And the prison teaches you to survive in prison. It doesn't... Say that again. Repeat that. The prison teaches you to survive in prison. When you're learning things and they say, oh, we have all these programs and, you know, we're teaching them this and we're teaching them that. They're teaching those things under the umbrella of surviving in prison. So when I learned to cook, I learned how to cook in prison. I learned how to cook for the prison. I stuff, I come out here and I'm like, what is that? And they was like, well, you the chef. I'm like, I I never, it's a, it's a mushroom. What's the chicken in there? What's the chicken in there? It's not just chicken. It's whatever you remove from the cafeteria. It it's, sounds it sounds funnier when you put chicken with it. Yes. Though. Well, when you have that that chicken that you have removed from the chow hall, it's crotchet chicken. That's right. Yes. Whatever you have to crotch to remove, because you know you stick it there <laughs> so that you can get it out. And they was like, oh, you got some of that crotchy chicken? Yes, I do. How many pieces you want? <laughs> so it's, it's just that you learn to survive in there. And it's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Because you're there in that moment. You need to make it through. However, there needs to be an understanding that, and I say this, and some people feel... I could probably find a better way to say it, but it just is what it is. There are only two things that are going to happen once you are incarcerated. You're either going to die in there or you're going to get out. And if I get out, what is it you want me to do? You want me to move forward. You want me to be successful. You don't want me to be hungry and live next door to you because I'm coming over there to get something to eat. I'm not just going to sit here and be hungry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not going to sit here and be hungry. You don't, that's not what you want. So you want me to have the skills to be able to maintain and take care of myself so that we can be friends and barbecue together. Yeah, she can cook too. You'd much rather have her, yes, you know, you. cooking for her, for you than coming over and raiding your refrigerator. Yeah, but you, you want me to know things. There's a stove, and um, when you cut it on, it clicks. Yeah, it, gas stove. Yeah, it goes. And when I first cut the stove on, I'm like, "What the hell? I'm about to blow up the block. Somebody need to come and help me." So they was like, "Oh, you turned it too far." And I'm like, well, y'all should have told me because I'm going to blow up the block. And it's just little simple things that we just don't get. You you know what I'm saying? I I had gotten when I got out, I didn't have an identification card. That's the very one of the first three things that they teach you in prison is one, don't tell everything you know. Two, don't go anywhere without your identification and figure out the third one. So, but the second one, don't go anywhere without your identification. So you guys have released me into a a society where it is actually law for me not to have my identification card on me and not just a rule, it's a law. And I'm just out here with no ID. So luckily, blessedly, 
that they really wanted me to vote. And this was my first time and they really wanted me to vote. So they stepped forward and pulled some strings and everything and found out why I didn't have an identification card. And I didn't have an identification card because I didn't have a birth certificate because I'm from Chicago. And so Chicago says, well, she can't get a birth certificate without an ID. And they're like, well, that's what she's trying to get, an ID, and she needs that birth certificate. So they had to pull some strings. But what if you don't have someone to pull strings? Let me point out another part about how ridiculous that is. They knew who you were enough to incarcerate you for 34 years. Absolutely. Then they release you into society and say, we don't know who you are anymore. No. You know, so you can't do all the things that everybody else in society, but it was good enough to keep you incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the kind of things that it's not just the experiences. It's the way you get gaslit to believe that certain logical ways of thinking are wrong. When you question things and you're like, that makes no sense. I mean, I had a discussion um, with somebody not too long ago about their mentoring progress program and their mentoring program is based on a fully volunteer model. And so basically I said, so let me get this straight. For 27 years, you paid me $1.77 a day. For five days, not all days, five days. Uh, well, it depends. I, I I managed to get yeah. some seven day weeks in there. You figure yeah. out how to work some of that okay. stuff. Still, that doesn't add up to a lot, but $1.77 a day. And now that I am free, you don't even want to give me the $1.77. To work from you. And they look at you like, like you're the one that it, that's come on. That does not make sense under any sets of circumstances, except for in the twisted logic of a system that has dehumanized millions of people at this point. And ma a matter of fact, they haven't dehumanized people. It's not like something that is new. This is based on a system that has always seen the people that were incarcerated as less than people. And I don't and I don't want to go too 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 far down that rabbit hole, but it but it needs to be said because this isn't something this isn't something that's new. This isn't something this is what the system was designed to do. The system was designed to to, to lock up people that other people didn't think were people. And so we can't be surprised at this point in time, though we are, that in 2022 it still isn't a humanized system. Now, I will give credit, and I will think Luanda will agree to this, that there is change afoot, but there is slow change afoot. Some of the people who are coming into the system have a different way of looking at this. It's not just criminal justice. There's a social worker component that's coming in that believes in healing people. But that isn't the system that Luanda and I experienced you know, Absolutely. in the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s. 80s. Yeah. yeah. Well, you beat yeah. me there by a few years. I'm out here and it's like no identification. I'm going there everywhere. I can't cash a check. As a matter of fact, my friends came and picked me up to take me out to eat. And we went to a strip club because they're like, oh, they have the best lamb chops. I'm like, in a strip club? And they're like, yes. I could so never get away with that excuse. <laughs> never. So they're like, yeah, it's the best food and entertainment. So I'm like, okay, let's go. So we get up there, and I know, I mean, I may not be looking the, at that time I was 51. I may not be looking 51, but I'm sure I look more than 21. You're beautiful. So thank you very much. So we're um, at the door or whatever and trying to get in to get these lamb chops, you know, and whatever entertainment is going to be <laughs> behind those doors. Is that what they call them? Yes. Not lamb chops? Yeah, entertainment <laughs> and lamb chops. So, okay, I'm, I'm here for the lamb chops. So, um, and my friends, they for the entertainment. So we're going to get it all together. So the people is like, um... We need to see your ID. I'm like, I don't know ID. And I'm like, I know you know I'm over 18. And they was like, it's 21. And you may be over 21, but we can't let you in without identification. Are you serious? I'm 
50 something years old. How can I not get in here for entertainment and lamb chops? <laughs> and uh, so they would not let me in to that strip club without no identification. Did your friends go without no, you? No, they wouldn't. Oh, I wish good. y'all would. Oh. So, no, absolutely. So they we would all, not be friends yeah, anymore. Yeah, so we all had to leave, you know, and it and that I felt bad about that because they didn't get in and they were down here, you know, for lamb chops and entertainment. So they didn't get theirs either. So we had to end up going somewhere else. But it's just what seems to be oh that's no big deal they didn't let you in but it is when i'm i'm trying to buy food cuz they haven't given me any stamps or trying to pay rent or something and i got my little um $80 check from the state for the last month that i worked and i can't even cash it and they're looking at me like first of all why why you got this state check and it's, this is like $80. You coming in here like you the big spender. I'm going to be needing this $80. So I can't cash a hundred ID. So it's a lot of, you know, little, little things that make it extremely hard to, you know, be able to come out and move forward and be successful. But I've gotten past all those things. So we can't just stay stuck there. I've gotten past them with support and I've been able to move forward and I, you know, am like so blessed. And that is why I speak out and I do the things that I do because of my experience. And I want to try to save someone else from that experience, you know, because it, it breaks my heart. Like, really, when someone comes out and they're trying to move forward and make it, and then they're violated, you know, and they have to go back to that. And they were doing everything that they could possibly do. Some people can make it and survive and and become. And then there's others that just need a little bit more than what you needed to make it. Yeah, I want to I want to I want to bring it around to something, too, because I want to I want to get into that part, how you did do some of those things that ended up being transferable skills. And the only reason I believe the lamb chop story is because I know more that food comes up a, a, a lot. So I want you to kind of promote what you're doing now and how those skills transferred. And I also want to say this, because I think what LaWanda brings, and, she, and you'll hear more about it, but what LaBronda, uh, La, La, LaBronda, uh, yeah. what LaWanda, that sees that superstar <laughs> right there, yeah. that's LaBronda. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's just stick with LaWanda. Let's stick with LaWanda. Yeah. It's been a long day yeah. for me too. <laughs> Um, let's let, but, but I want people to understand something because I think sometimes people who are formerly incarcerated, um, are a lot of people have a tendency to just think that we should be grateful for everything. And I think we mm. should, but it's not your place to tell me what I should be grateful for. And it's not for you to decide what that lane looks like. And so I Absolutely. think this is extremely important for people to understand sometimes because nice. when she talks about her business that she does, people need to understand something. She doesn't just provide the product. She provides Lawanda and that adds to the product. So anything that you would kind of look at and be like, well, if I was going to hire somebody to do this, you need to put a premium on that for what she brings to it, not feel that somehow there should be a discount. And I'm I'm saying this in general because I think this happens a lot of times to people who are formerly incarcerated because everybody thinks we should be grateful. But I'm saying this in this interview because I want Lawanda to hear it and I want everybody else to hear it too because she is valuable. She needs to be treated as such. And the fact that she is actually having to struggle the way she still does to make ends meet 
to me, is a disservice and an injustice because she is out here killing it every single day. And people don't feel, don't, you know, don't misunderstand. I know my worth. I simply am stronger about the the advocacy point of it because I want you to understand my worth. Mm. And not only me, but all my sisters and brothers. You know, people are like, oh, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime and all that. Come on now. I did my time. And me personally, they just they didn't give me anything extra. I didn't get no no commutation or not. There's the same thing wrong with that. But me personally, I didn't receive, I did what the state told me to do. I served my time. And actually, I did two years more than what I was supposed to do because I was a hellion when I went in. Mm. And so I did what I was supposed to do. And now I'm out here and I'm trying to make things work. And I think that because of that, people try to take advantage of that. I know that you're trying to take advantage of it, but I let it ride because of the advocacy part. But then when my mentors or someone see well, why did you let this ride? Or how come this is like that? I try to explain to them. And it's like, I talked to I talked to a gentleman from uh, Fresh Coast Alliance. Nate? Nate, yes. I talked to Nate. And the advocacy is not going to satisfy my suppliers or my supporters. If I'm spending $200 on food and I'm making $210, I'm happy with that $10. But my supporters, they're like, no, because that $200 actually was mine. So what are we going to do with this $10? We can't. How are we going to split this? My point is, as I simply said before, I know my worth. I'm simply trying to get you or other people to understand my words. Share one of the vehicles, one of the, the big vehicle that how you get your message out there and the ways that you use it. Well, I don't want to be shouting out, but I'll shout I, out. Okay. <laughs> it's the chow hall. The yes. chow hall is it the, yes. the, the chow hall is brilliant. What thank city? you. It's here. It, it's me. I am the oh, chow hall. Are. I am the chow hall. When, initially when I came out. I was supposed to be trying to, and they give you all these resources that don't really pan out, but I was supposed to be starting a food truck. So pandemic hit and all kind of stuff happened. So basically now what I do is pop-ups and catering with the chow hall, which is a prison inspired menu with a twist of the it's free society, my community, you know, things like that. Like I with Melvin at We the People Opportunity Farm, I use fresh vegetables from him and different places like that. And I go around to different events like uh, open my door. Now, since I've said open my door, let me put this out here because people don't know these type of things. They think, oh, I'm just out here making money, serving prison food, and it's Raymond noodles for everybody. The open my door, and I made a post. If anyone has not been incarcerated, I would strongly suggest that you see the play, The Box. However, if you have been incarcerated, I would only suggest you see it because it is so well done. It de- picks what goes on in isolation Mm. to the T. And because of that, the two days in which I had to go 
to that play to try to sell that food to get, you know, the word out, I was triggered by that Mm -hmm. in such a way that afterwards I did something that could have ended me back up in prison because immediately it set me back into that environment. It it was like on my spirit. And I really didn't understand it until the trauma camp and, you know, talking to the counselors and, you know, you airing and getting stuff out. Mm -hmm. And I realized that was what that was because that incident, that's not me. I've been away from that. I don't act like that. But having that, the sound that, it's a sound that you can never, you know, for some people it might be key. Some For some people it might even be as simple as the microwave or the smell of popcorn. Because like, I remember Jadonna Young, she was, the smell of that popcorn, microwave popcorn set her off. So it's different things for different people. But that sound of those gates closing was like, what, why would they do this? Not just the sound, but when that there's a feel and, to and that. It's, it's like it's stuck here in your tonsils. It's like, get out of there. But it's like, ugh. And so that happened. While I'm trying to advocate, I'm setting myself up to be in these situations and have these moments and things like that. But now that I'm aware, I can handle them better. And I know going forward, but at that time I didn't know. And it's like, it brought me to tears both days. I cried several times and it was like, okay, I cried is over, is done. But that wasn't the case because the next day I was faced with the incident that I did not handle properly. So not just being out here making noodles and, you know, uh, prison fluff and different things like that. I'm setting myself in a space where I can be triggered again so that I can help my sisters and brothers as they come along. So that you understand what it is they're going through, you know, or why, why are they putting the clothes in the washing machine like that? You know, because that was like a real thing for me. The person was like, why are you doing it like that? Because I haven't washed in 30 years. I put my stuff in a bag and throw it in the hallway. Let me say something. I want, because before we go down that road, Mm -hmm. I want to back up because it's extremely important. Because it goes with what we were talking about with worth. It goes along with what we were talking about valuing the voice of the formerly incarcerated. If you do anything in this world for 34 years, you're considered an expert and your expertise is valued. But if you're a computer programmer for 34 years, there's not a lot of trauma that's associated with your knowledge. And yet they will ask us to do something for free. They will ask us to do something at a discount when these things very well can rub across those traumas. And and people ask me all the time, like, you've seen how different we've moved the furniture around and stuff. I don't like a desk being between people because it, like, in it, somehow it's like power. It reminds me of healthcare or something like that. Like, we were talking about possibly getting a vehicle so that we could start being able to transport people for the first couple months that if they were going to have them working in different facilities and stuff like that to make that part easier on them. Everybody said, well, why don't you buy one of those 15 passenger cargo vans? Because I spent 27 years shackled in the back of one of them. And I don't want to trigger somebody with something simpler like that. And so this is one of the reasons why our voice is valuable, not because we're the only ones that have knowledge, not because we have the only ones that have good ideas, but because we have ideas that you could not possibly imagine if you haven't been in that situation. She's talking about Raymond noodles. I know some people will not have a Raymond noodle in their house to this day 
because it was such a part of their life that 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 they have rejected it entirely. Mm-hmm. So I'll hand it back over to you. But I didn't want that to go to go without uh, being said because that's one of the things is she's not just bringing like she said a noodle bread sandwich. She's not just bringing the prison fluff. She's not even just bringing Lawanda. She's bringing Lawanda and all of her scars as well. And so people need to respect that because the people who choose to face these things, choose to face their demons in a public way like this, they do it. And there's 20 of us out there that are scared to death that won't say anything about it and live their life in the shadows. And that is another reason why the Luandas of the world are so valuable. Well, thank you. So how do people find you? So basically, whenever I do, I'm, I work with a lot of nonprofits that center around, even though I've done things that were not centered around reentry, I work with a lot of nonprofits here in Washtenaw or here in Michigan, period. And, you know, they just, it's word of mouth, mm-hmm. basically. And that's what I do. You know, I'm I'm most definitely with Nation Outside because I truly believe in what they do. And it's a nation of us out here. It is a it is truly a nation of us out here. So um, and people say, well, how can you work with a brighter way and American friends and nation outside? And wh- why are you all over the place? Why you can't just pick one place? Because we're all about going forward. And that's all I care about is that we're going forward. So if Adam is doing something, which I feel like is going to be um, necessary or needs to be heard with a brighter way for our community, so to speak, then I'm there for that. Nation Outside, I'm there for that. They Nation Outside just did the expungement program. I'm all over that. I'm all over that. I can't get my crime expunged, but guess what? One of my sisters and one of my brothers can. So y'all need to be here. You understand what I'm saying? So that's that's what I'm doing. As long as we are going forward and other people are like, oh, well, I didn't know that. I'm good. That I'm satisfied because now you know. Because now you know. Yeah, and it's not competition. We're all yes. we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. We might be trying to do it in different ways. I mean, you'll see me in Nation Outside events all the time. Mm-hmm. I, I love Nation Outside. Mm-hmm. I go to there. I go to. I, I work in Ipsy. I go to meetings in Lansing. I go to meetings in Jackson because we need these voices. People need to hear the story. They need to. People need to know that their values are being attacked in certain ways. And the prison system ta- attacks most people's values mm-hmm. in the world, but. But until you have somebody usually who's affected by it, you don't understand the degree to that. And that's why we have to show up. She knows. She knows she's always a part of our family. And I'm never going to be like, why did you go over here? I'm going to be like, why didn't you tell me the event was going on? That's basically the people that I've been able to deal with. There will, there has been one or two that will be like, well, you know, uh, well, I work for such and such. And. I'm not going to go, well, guess what? I am, and i see you later. And that's all I got to say to that. You are entitled to that. But I am truly about us going forward. There's no reason for so many of us to be homeless. Yes, there's homeless people that have not been incarcerated, but there's a higher number of homeless people that have been incarcerated. There's no reason for us not to be able to get a decent, livable wage, a good job. Yes, there's a lot of people that don't have a job, but there's a higher percentage of people that have been incarcerated that cannot get a job. I had to, even to get in school, I had to go through, I'm like, oh, I'm not getting ready to do all this. These people want to know too much information about too many things that I don't want to tell them just to be able to get into school. 
I'm going to go back to what Robin said, though, because Robin's trying to get you to make a plug. About the child home. So if if somebody wants to hire you <laughs> exactly. and bring... They you, can call me. 586-295-4643. And y'all don't just be calling me to be calling me. True that. True that. <laughs> That's yeah. why I ain't putting my phone number out yeah, there. Yeah, take care. I don't care. Because uh, my mother used to say, I'd be like, don't tell nobody our address. She said they can come over here if they want to. So you call me if you want to. <laughs> So I don't care. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, I think it's time to do the last question. You think about it. All right. I'll, I mean, I think that this is always important, and, and we say a lot of different things, And but I think that it's important to kind of encapsulate that too. So if you've got a message to anybody who is currently incarcerated, somebody who's formerly incarcerated, or somebody who's on their way home, matter of fact, let me add to this, or one person in society that you think needs to know something about your experience while in and while out, what would you tell them? And I know that's a big responsibility and you say a lot, but what's on your heart right now? Support, because that's what got me through my incarceration is the support of my peers. And once I came home, that is what is now getting me through is support. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we meet up at different times. And so I have different groups, I would say, that support me in different ways and different manners. But it takes a village. It takes a village. So all my little individual support groups, they're my village. And... They consist of older people who have lived, you know, uh, been around for a long time. They know, you know, a lot of things that I don't. Mm -hmm. And you ain't talking about your LOLs. Yes, my LOLs. <laughs> I love you. I love you, my LOLs. Them is Lawanda's old lady. So, you know, they were like one of my initial support groups. And even the lady, the friend of the friend, she allowed me into her house and, you know, showed me some things. And then I moved on from that. And then when I was in a lonely space, it came to my sisters. You know, they're like, what you doing? I'm sitting on the side of the bed. We coming to get you, you know. And so I was able to go and experience things, even though I couldn't get into the strip club, you know, <laughs> different things. So at different times. And then. Like there's there's Al Newman. He showed me how to do this. And hey, this is what I think you should do with this. And this is what I think you. So it's different people at different times. But to me, they're all my village. I learned how to drive. I My house got together, how to pay bills. How, I had never wrote a check. And, you know, though, so those things are like simple and like other people don't even think about just write the check. But I had never did that. And so now it's just like, you know, I can do that. I spent hours one time in uh, Big Sam's. Sam's Club. Yeah, in Sam's Club. I spent hours, hours in there. And, and they were like, oh, if she don't come on. But... <laughs> Is you know, it's just having those people there right. for that moment. And so if you can be support for someone in that moment, be that support. If you need support, try to find someone who can help you in that moment. I just did a post the other day. And I've been saying this for like many, many years, but relationships and friendships are like a bus. People are going to get on and off. Some people are intended for a longer ride. Some people are going to get off at the next stop. You have people who didn't pay to get on and you have people who paid to get on. You have people that got off before you wanted them to get off. But you're not in charge of those people. You're not in charge of the passenger, but you are the driver. So you're in charge of where the bus goes. 
So if you come into my life and this is all the encounter that you and I have, allow me to gain something from that. Allow me to give something in that. And then you may be off the bus and I'm all right with that. You know, I because people have a hard time. If you get on my bus and you've been helpful, I, I got to hold on to you. But what you're doing is you're taking up the seat for Adam to get on the bus. So when it's time for you to get off the bus, get off the bus. And I need to let you off the bus because I need Adam to be on there. I would have let you do a drop the mic moment because that was really good. And that's like my metaphors and and analogies. That's like my, I love that. Uh, I'll probably steal it at some (laughs) point in time. But there's one thing that I want to leave you with because this is the recurring theme. And I hear you say that you know your worth, but I don't think you do. I think you know your worth a lot. I don't think you realize the true value. And so the reason why I'm saying that is, is because even as you explain these things, you talked about all these other people and what they bring to you and somehow they're a part of the village. You're a part of a lot of people's village and you're valuable. Thank you for speaking today and sharing. for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Conversations About a Brighter Way. Welcome home. We would like to say thank you to the following. This podcast could not have been possible without Grove Studio providing the space. So Grove Studios is in Ypsilanti, Michigan, provides 24-7 self-service, rehearsal, and creative studios for musicians, hip-hop producers, DJs, podcasters, photo, video, and live streaming production. Creatives from around Southeast Michigan have called Grove home since 2018. For more information and booking, check them out online at grovestudios.space. We'd like to thank Patrick Domingo with podcast creation and editing. The beautiful music you hear in the intro and thank yous was written and performed by Chelsea-based singer, songwriter Annie Caps. If you're looking for a rootsy vibe, a touch of twang, and a soulful groove, look no further. You can find her at anniecaps.com. That's A-N-N-I-E-C-A-P-P-S dot com. We'd like to thank our individual donors. Without them, there could not be a brighter way. Therefore, there could not be a conversation about a brighter way. We're very grateful for their constant support and the way they speak to the stigma that exists in the community on a daily basis. We'd like to thank United Way of Washtenaw County, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, Nation Outside, and to our volunteers, mentors, and mentees. A Brighter Way is a community, and we could not be a community without all of its participants. So we thank all of you. Thank you very much. Wait, subscribe and follow us on social media so you don't miss out on a single episode. And visit the website of brighterway.org for donation opportunities. We plan to give you more conversations in Season 1, and if you want to reach out to ask questions or send comments, you can email volunteering at abrighterway.org. This is Robin. And this is Adam. Peace out. Peace out.